Hello, everyone. You're listening to American Indian Airwaves. For Marcus Lopez, I'm your host, Larry Smith. On today's program, we go to the country of Bolivia as we get an update on what happened in 2019 that led to the illegal ousting of Bolivia's president, Evo Morales, the first indigenous democratically elected president of a nation in world history. We'll hear from the director of the Andean Information Network on what happened, where we are now, and the U.S. government's complicity. All that and more here on American Indian Airwaves. You can hear when the moon shines bright, the lone through air in the black of the night. You can hear, you can hear the whisper in the valley. Mm-hmm. And you know when come a Kandy blows to the Bahu drum. On June 10th of 2022, a Bolivian court sentenced former de facto president of Bolivia, Janine Añez, to 10 years in prison. Añez assumed power during a violent coup in November 2019 that ousted the country's popular indigenous president, Evo Morales, sending him into exile and killing over 37 people. During Inez's short term as the illegal president, her government killed dozens of civilians and persecuted members of Morales's MAS party and confronted the COVID-19 pandemic with incompetence and corruption leading to mass starvations in the country's poorer regions. The new president, Luis Arce, took over in November and in December, The attorney general filed lawsuits against Inez for sedition and conspiracy, with the sedition charge later dropped. Today on American Indian Airways, we hear from the director of the Andean Information Network, a human rights organization based in Cochabamba, Bolivia, and the director, Catherine Lederber, writes extensively on drug policy and human rights in the Andes. She joins us along with Marcus Lopez, co-host and executive producer of American Indian Airwaves, to discuss the violent and the illegal coup that forcefully ousted the first democratically elected indigenous president in Bolivia and the United States government's complicity in directly and indirectly supporting along with American-based public relations firms, the November 2019 coup, the role of the extractive industries such as natural gas and lithium in helping destabilize the plurinational state and nation of Bolivia. And this is Catherine Lederber, director of the Andean Information Network. Catherine, thank you for joining us on American Engine Airways We wanted to touch base with you on since many years ago on specifically with the your article in Nakla magazine talked about Biden's bungles Bolivia and you mentioned the article about many things. Take us back to the coup, what that meant so so our listeners can get a good background of our going to come to our recent situation in Bolivia. Why don't you give us a background, please? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'd be happy to. You know, Evo Morales ran for a contested fourth term in 2019. And um, as soon as the first round of the elections concluded in October, the right wing began to claim there was fraud. In in fact, the the right wing began to say there would be electoral fraud even six months before the elections began. And this was something that was was quite curious. 
and pro right wing protests increased and uh, violence increased. And finally, uh, the Organization of American States claimed there was electoral fraud, although there was absolutely no statistical or evidentiary basis for that. And, and all of these claims have been refuted by scholars from MIT and in publications like the New York Times and the Washington Post and academic articles. So what happened at that point in time? With the support of the U.S. government, a right wing appointed itself to the presidency. First, they violently attacked everyone in the line of concession, Abel Morales' family, family members of the vice president, family members of the head of the Senate and the head of the lower house of Congress, forcing them all to resign in a one-day period after that announcement and allowing a relatively unknown far-right fringe Senator Janine Añez to square herself in as president of the Senate and then as president of the country, it's something totally violating the Constitution. And I think it harks back to the days, Marcus, of, of Plan Condor, where the military actually are the ones that place the presidential medal on her neck. And at that point in time, we begin to see what was, in essence, a new Plan Condor, right-wing governments in Argentina sending weapons. Uh, right-wing government in Ecuador also sending weapons. Very, very quickly, violence in the street increased as the military went out and started shooting. We had her state groups that were very, very racist, and one of the things that they attacked was indigenous people. They associated the first indigenous president in Bolivia, Abel Morales, who had had popular three terms and had won by outright majorities with uh, indigenous people and the mosque parties. And they went after dark-skinned people, anyone with indigenous fe features, women in traditional uh, polleras, the indigenous women's skirts of Quechua and Aymara. There were brutal beatings, killings, rapes, and really the targeting of all of the representative groups of the mosque coalition, indigenous peoples, workers groups, grassroots and community journalists. And this lot was very, very violent, including two massacres. And this went on for an 11 month period and overlapped with the pandemic. Very violent, a lot of political persecution, a lot of support from the United States and a very, very racist Focus. It reminds me very much of what the right wing attempted to do in the Capitol in the United States on January 6, 2021, with their right wing ultra racist groups and uh, ignoring the election. I think it's really a scary phenomenon, but in Bolivia, it succeeded. And we're still struggling to get past this kind of corrosive, racist, divisive um period in Bolivian history to kind of retreat back into the, into the 70s and with the armed forces making decisions, with the presence of mercenaries from different countries vying for contracts. And although we returned to democracy in November 20, a wing of the MAS party has been that's less representative of social movements, less representative of indigenous people. So although we've returned to a democratically elected government, there are still concerns about representation and the scars that are left by this very violent coup. Catherine, why don't you describe to our listeners, just to remind ourselves of, you mentioned MAS. What is that and how it's so important? What do they stand for? What was their program? Well, MAS, the Movement Towards Socialism, is the party name for what started as a grassroots movement, which was the um, independent movement for the sovereignty of peoples. And, and it really got its start in the coca fields with the Aymara and Quechua farmers in the Cochabamba tropics, the uh, Chapari region. These people had migrated to that region. They were stigmatized and repressed by the government and funded by U.S. policy, this re repression. And they worked very hard to gain, they had a dual strategy. 
you know, union leaders, some descendants of mining unions, others descendants of agrarian unions of indigenous peoples that were so crucial in the 1952 revolution. They had a strategy of direct protest blocking the main highway in the country, sometimes for a period of 40 days, and an electoral strategy, an electoral strategy that allowed this grassroots party, which started with only people power and the rejection of a corrupt right-wing neoliberal government to grow into the largest political force in Bolivia and that was in government nonstop from 2006 to November 2019 with a majority in the Congress, all democratically elected, all representing what Bolivia became during this Abel Morales government, a plurinational state, a state that incorporates the 34 indigenous language, indigenous Wipala flag, the inclusion of all of the different peoples of Bolivia, that of a republic, which was on the light upper class descendants of, of colonialists that had dominated Bolivia for so long. Catherine, you talked about the three turns of Morales and about the Moss. The talk about a little bit of the impact within those three terms about you mentioned the plurinational state. I know that when he was elected, many leaders of indigenous people up and down the continent talked about the remarkable effect of an indigenous leader, him being the first one within our time in the sense of uh, their legislation. What is, what's the impact on legislation and this multi-pluralism legislation? Talk about that for a second. Well, I, I think that there, that there, was, there were some key advances. And, and one was the 2009 Constitution that was developed in a constitutional assembly, which was approved by a majority of Bolivian voters, which establishes the plurinational state, which makes official language Spanish as well as all the indigenous languages of Bolivia and mandates that by region those languages must be taught in schools. A, a crucial initiative, it establishes the right for prior consent for indigenous populations for any extractive effort or any public works that are going on in their territory. This is something that exists in the legislation of very few nations. Most people have to uh, look back to the Treaty of Indigenous People from the United Nations in 1988 or the International Labor Organization, Article 169, which stipulates this prior consent. A strong basis of environmental protection through the law of Mother Earth, and a legislative framework which is unprecedented and quite impressive. As always, the implementation of this legislation was imperfect, and the Morales administration made huge progress in, in increasing the quality of life for all Bolivians. And so during, uh, during his three terms, um, literacy, access to health care, education, all improved, access to potable water, other basic services, electricity, all improved. Poverty went down, infant mortality rate went down. And we had a legislative framework which allowed us to progress towards a more egalitarian state. You have a, had a Bolivian Congress filled with representatives from different indigenous nations, special congressional seats for different indigenous peoples, the right to indigenous autonomy for municipalities. Huge strides and huge strides in terms of inclusion, indigenous cabinet members, indigenous uh, foreign minister, high-ranking officials that came from rural areas, from different cultures, and this was very important. Imperfect. A, pro uh, a process, they call it the process of change, which didn't reach its peak, which needed to evolve, which needed to be perfected, and which, as a result of the coup and the pandemic and the current ongoing political strife, something that's become... Uh, postponed and it, and has become increasingly more urgent.
and you're listening to American Indian Airwaves. We're speaking with Catherine Letterber of the Andean Information Network with an update on the 2019 coup forcing former indigenous president of Bolivia, Eva Morales, into exile, the U.S. government's complicity, and more. And now back to the interview here on American Indian Airwaves. Catherine, what does that mean? You, we meant, you mentioned the, you might say, the movement that will benefit the people. But Chad, the, the indigenous people here in North America and then the rest of the American public don't see those gigantic steps forward, not only in the political sense, not only in legislation sense. What was the feeling, the ground feeling, the groundswell, if you will, of people, indigenous people and people of color within that country and what was it feeling like? Describe that to us here in North America. Well, you know, certainly I'm not an indigenous person, but but uh, it was a palpable difference. The celebrations with Morales' election, um, the inclusion, uh, the ability, I mean, you saw for the first time uh, IU leaders and community leaders welcome in the presidential palace. You know, they weren't welcome in, in government offices. They weren't welcome in banks. They weren't welcome, you know, it was a very, very long process to actually have inclusion for what is the largest portion of the Bolivian population. You know, Bolivia has the highest indigenous population of any country in South America. And so, you know, it was, and I think that what had changed and what had been it only became clear and palpable when it was taken away. And I still remember when we documented the Wayani massacre, which was uh, three days after the coup government's takeover and where they fired on a march of coca growers protesting the attacks on the indigenous women and the forced resignation of Morales and killed 10 people and hundreds more had bullet wounds. You know, the interviews with the people who, who said, we now know what our rights are. We're not going to have them taken away again. We had 14 years of peace. We're not going to be cannon fodder. They're treating us like animals. They don't believe that we're human anymore. I, I, I think, you know, gradual progress and inclusion, and at the same time frustration with some of the shortfalls of the Morales government, you, when you when that government goes up in smoke and you're automatically repressed for speaking an indigenous language, for having dark skin, for dressing a certain way, for wearing braids in the case of women, um, it, it was something that all of a sudden people knew what had been lost. And people were very, very, very vocal about it. And, of course, being vocal brought repression. Catherine, in your article uh, with Brent uh, Gustafsson and, and yourself, you mentioned, obviously, you mentioned in this interview, Jenny Arnaz, uh, the 10 years, uh, sentenced to 10 years in prison. Um, but you also mentioned that he postponed the election three times under the pretext of the pandemic. And then, finally, the erupt 11 months of violence and corruption. This individual, her right-hand man, Arturo Morillo, talk about him. What was, and, and the surrounding elements of that, Why? what was the significance about this? Not only one person, but yet the whole group of uh, cohorts in that um, that coup government that was created. Right. Well, she, you know, Arturo Morillo, I had known because he worked in the Cochabamba tropics and the for 20 years, and we always thought he was a crazy person, but we never believed that he was a crazy person that would have any political power. Him, along with Cesar Lopez, who was a former high-ranking military officer, and another group of, you know, repressive, like-minded individuals, took over power. You know, Mar uh, Arturo Murillo, and they all began to Speak of indigenous people using uh, the terms savages, animals, 
I'll hunt them down like a dog. They're ignorant. They shouldn't be wearing shoes. All of these very public, blatant statements. You know, Arturo Murillo right now is serving a sentence for money laundering and corruption in the Miami federal prison. He tried to launder money for tear gas through the American banking system. And that ended up badly for them. But he still has to face, and no one has faced, judicial consequences for the massacre. Three years later, the trials haven't begun. Um, and, and I think that that's very worrisome, because I think in order for Bolivia to, to grow, to progress, to become the plur, plur, purely plurinational and inclusive state that it projects to be, we're going to have to have some justice and some consequences and some guarantees that this isn't going to happen ever again. And at this point in time, uh, the Bolivian people and the victims haven't received that. Catherine, um, in leading up to the the coup, ousting uh, Morales and sending him in, into exile, what about the role of the United States? And you know, certainly there's a long political legacy of uh, the United States and various agencies toppling governments, and certainly throughout Latin America. But um, what was the, the United States' role? And I know um, you've mentioned in your article uh, in other interviews the role of the public relations industry, particularly here in the United States, working on behalf of the state in toppling foreign governments. And so I was wondering maybe you could speak to that, such as CSL strategies or the National Endowment uh, Democracy, for example. Sure. I mean, I think this was very clearly, it's not necessarily something that we thought would be successful, but there was almost immediate recognition from the Morales administration and also uh, of the new government, uh, condemnation of the election by the European Union and by the Trump administration, the announcement almost immediately that ambassadors would be exchanged with the new government. Um, because the Morales administration had expelled the U.S. ambassador in 2008, and the U.S. had followed suit. It seems very clear that it's a coup. You know, I don't know if you heard the John Bolton interview where he said, I know I've planned coups before, and it's time-consuming. And remember that John Bolton was national security advisor up until several weeks before the Bolivian coup. And every indication shows that his head of Latin America, Mauricio Claver Carone, was one of the key figures in setting up and facilitating this coup process. Uh, with close collaboration, close coordination of the National Security Council uh, with the coup government, um, there seems to be military to military support between the defense ministry and some areas of the U.S. military, although there was no direct involvement in troops. Uh, worrisome evidence of the role of mercenaries. Mm. One, a group of mercenaries that is not clear that they ever arrived to Bolivia, but American citizen that was recruiting them from Bolivia to come, and then the presence of uh, Colombian mercenaries that were hired by a security for firm in Miami, one of the members of the security firm, an active FBI agent at the time, which, sent, uh, which went down to Bolivia during the 2020 elections, uh, apparently to impede the election of the new president, Luis Arce. These turned out to be the same mercenaries that assassinated the Haitian president the following year. So what you have is not a traditional plan condor U.S. interventionist model where you send money directly or where you send troops or where you send financial services, because one of the things that we were able to achieve through the U.S. Congress with kind of several of the more progressive members is to put a hold on any funding to go to Bolivia besides funds to facilitate elections. 
because there was a real risk that they were going to channel a lot of money in there. But what you see in a 21st century coup is the role of the media, uh, the U.S. National Endowment for Democracy, or actually funds, I'm not sure if it was the International Republican Institute or the National Democratic Institute that funded the Bolivian National Press Association. The National Endowment for Democracy funded uh, press associations, human rights and justice organizations, electoral monitoring organizations. And curiously, and this is something that I complained to the U.S. government about, when there were massacres and cases of torture and cases of uh, you know racist attacks, and paramilitary groups, none of the groups funded by the U.S. government spoke out. And I think that's very noticeable. And the other thing was, and this is something that you mentioned, Larry, when you talked about CLS strategies, a wave of fake news that flooded Facebook, that flooded WhatsApp, that flooded Twitter, a whole bunch of bots, and and a, a large amount of them funded by a U.S. company, CLS Strategies, and their uh, primary advisor for Latin America was uh, Mark Fierstein, a former Clinton administration official. He was the head of the NSC for Latin America and head of USAID for Latin America under Obama and had represented Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada, the president who's now living in the Washington, D.C. area after the massacre of 68 indigenous people above La Paz in the gas war in 2003. Mm -hmm. So there was a wave of misinformation, and there was also an effort to impede any information coming out or documentation about the violence. You know, people's Facebook accounts froze. Anyone that had a, a telephone with the Bolivian state company that account was removed. Internet access was limited in rural areas so that indigenous people and rural unions couldn't organize. And so it, it's a more modern coup using a wide range of weapons. And I think it's kind of set the tone for these far-right attempts to overthrow elections or to overthrow popular movements across the continent. What's so hard to understand is that the Biden administration faced something very similar on January 6th, yet they have maintained the Trump administration's line on Libya. And it's so disappointing and perplexing, but it's, it's one of the many flaws in Biden's Latin American foreign policy. And just a point of clarification, when you talk about um, CLS strategies and, and kind of the weaponization in soft power um, uh, military parlance of social media platforms like WhatsApp and, and others, are they creating accounts targeting Americans as well to sway public opinion in alignment with uh, the Biden administration's policies at the time, or are they just targeting uh, Bolivianos and indigenous peoples within the plurinational state of Bolivia? Well, the accounts that were identified by CLS Strategies, and this is something that uh, a Stanford Research Institute identified and something that was published by the Washington Post tech deck. It wasn't some, I mean, we knew there was fake news, but we didn't know where it was coming from. All of those accounts were, that were identified because they were looking at accounts in Spanish, were Spanish language accounts to mm. sway public opinion. There were some English language bots. It was quite interesting on Twitter because, you know, there was obviously a quota for bots and it would start, so the first or the second of every month, there would be tons of bots, and, and then it, they would slow down, and then at the first of the month again, they would restart. So, you know, I would say that more of the external public opinion was through the funding of journalists and, and people who were funded by the National Endowment for Democracy but presented themselves as political analysts to newspapers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, 
and that really w- w- were able to kind of dictate a line. And it was really a, a kind of long grassroots struggle to actually document things and get the information out. And to have the Inter-American Human Rights Commission appear when it did was a lifesaver. Uh, that doesn't mean that the Inter-American Human Rights Commission always makes the right decision, but with the with the documentation they presented, people could no longer deny that the killing was taking place. And you're listening to American Indian Airwaves. We were speaking with Catherine Lederberg, director of the Andean Information Network. She's providing us an update on the 2019 coup in Bolivia that ousted the first democratically elected indigenous president, Eva Morales, the U.S. government's complicity, and more. You're listening to American Indian Airwaves. We're going to take a short break, and we'll come back with part two of our interview with Catherine Lutteber of the Andean Information Network. And you're listening to American Indian Airwaves. In part two of our show for today, we continue our interview with Catherine Lederberg of the Andean Information Network. She's speaking on the illegal 2019 coup that forced the first democratically elected indigenous president, Eva Morales of Bolivia, into exile, the U.S. government's complicity, and more. We continue with the update along with the role of the extractive mining industries and how COVID-19 pandemic impacted the poor people of Bolivia. And now back to the interview. Catherine, when you mentioned these characters that were part of the coup, I would be remiss if we didn't mention the role of U.S. Undersecretary of State David Hale. What was his role? And the... Cut to the chase is the question of why, why now, the coup? Well, I think, you know, my assessment is that the idea was, I mean, there was certainly there was U.S. government discontent from the, by beginning with the election of Morales. You know, the U.S. ambassador, when Morales was running uh, the first time, said, you know, if the coca grower, if people elect Abel Morales, They'll lose, you know, Bolivia will lose all its funding. But what happened was, you know, this disdain and, you know, a further souring of the relationship and the eventual removal of almost all U.S. economic assistance, you know, the idea was without or, or, you know, the foreign policy precept is that in Latin America, you have to obey the United States, that disobeying the United States or losing U.S. funding will mean that your country will collapse. And at this point in time, there was no U.S. funding, and Bolivia continued to thrive. Very frustrating and upsetting for the United States. So there were many attempts, uh, I think, facilitated by the U.S. to remove Morales. One was an uprising in the lowland of right-wing governors that received a lot of funding and support from the United States something that failed. There was an attempt uh, in 2016 to create fake news about an Abel Morales love child to thwart a a referendum allowing his reelection. I think that they had begun to plan an overthrow for that point in time, but Morales recognized his retreat. So I think this was viewed, you know, it was the Trump administration. The Trump administration knew that they were leaving soon. 
they had attempted to do something similar in Venezuela and failed. Uh, they, they wanted something as a calling card. They wanted, I think, also a dry run for this kind of strategy, which is a mix of, um, you know, social media manipulation, discourses, far right groups on the street, you know, as a dry run for what they tried to do with the U.S. election. So, you know, and I think the idea was anyone would be better for Bolivia than Abel Morales. And it turns out that the, per- the people they picked were bloody and hateful and repressive and, and corrupt. And I think that should be a valuable lesson about intervening in another nation's politics. Another part of that, Catherine, and you mentioned that in one of the article is talk about the massive mineral extraction industries and what that means for Bolivia. Well, you know, Bolivia, one of its, one of the ways that the Morales administration kind of fueled uh, a growing economy, uh, increases in public services, was through income from natural gas. And this for a long time through the hydrocarbons law, which was passed the year before Morales was elected, elected, allowed for an equitable distribution of the income from hydrocarbons and making sure that it was invested in local communities, in indigenous peoples, in, um, you know, in, in basic services. And that was a blessing to a certain extent, but it also created a certain dependency on that natural gas. And it meant that the communities where there was large natural gas income received a great deal of money, but perhaps there wasn't the guidance or the support to carry out public works or to invest it in a way that was most beneficial to the people. And what we're finding now is that we have uh, that exploration of natural gas has gone down, the production of the wells has gone down and we're looking and Bolivia is looking towards lithium to provide this source of income. Bolivia has more lithium than any country in the world. At this point in time, there's a small pilot plant where lithium extracted from a series of wells in the salt flats is then produced into lithium carbonate because the decision from the Morales administration, and it continues to this administration, is that Bolivia will no longer be a country that exports raw materials. They're going to export batteries and enjoy an added value from the refining of the lithium and from the production of batteries, which is something that, you know, in its past, when they were largely dependent on tin, and before that, a key source of silver for the Spanish Empire, none of that wealth stayed within the nation. So the challenge is how to take that small plant. I mean, it's quite impressive. There's already, you know, the only car made in Bolivia is a quantum electric car that's powered with a Bolivian battery. You know, they had signed an initial contract, and they're doing this with the evaporation ponds with very little negative environmental impact. We've gone up there with a team of scientists from Duke University and, and verified that. But the, so the issue is how, with this increasing need for clean energy, do you sign contracts or form a policy of large-scale extraction that's actually beneficial? And Bolivia had a contract, but that contract was canceled as part of the coup. In the runner-up to the coup, the right-wing desert demanded it would be canceled because they were worried that the income from lithium would strengthen Morales' position even more. So after many delays, Bolivia has now signed contracts with two Chinese companies and a Russian company for direct lithium extraction. They are carrying out the prior consent with the communities around the extraction zone. You know, Potosí, where most of the lithium takes place, is a former mining community. There are very high levels of unemployment. There are are relatively low levels of 
road infrastructure and basic services. So the challenge is now, can you create clean energy for the world while respecting your environment and while benefiting the peoples, not only the Bolivian people in general, but the people that reside near the lithium extraction zones. And that's, the ch- and that's one of the main economic challenges that's facing Bolivia today. Catherine, I remember um, visiting down there in La Paz back in 2008 and speaking with some of the MAS members about, um, you know, how do you reconcile, you know, the extractive industries and, you know, in this case, the mining of lithium uh, within the philosophical or cultural framework of indigenous people's worldviews. And so I, there was conversation at the time of not just mining the lithium, but also producing the batteries that, um, that you just uh, mentioned. And I was just Mm -hmm. wondering if um, the struggles uh, that indigenous peoples have with this model and, and this idea of contradictory uh, capitalism and what, what you've seen so far. Well, It really varies. I mean, we're talking about a country with 34 indigenous nations, you know, huge populations, some of them. And so you have sometimes contradictory views, and you have sometimes interests that that don't all align. I think that your position, if you're in an extraction zone, may be very different, you know, and that could be positive in a sense of more royalties and tax revenue for your community, or it could be negative in the sense of a negative environmental impact. So, you know, or communities that may benefit economically but are far from the extraction zone. It's a complex issue, and these are rights and respect and, uh, and a contradictory position where the desire is to expand social welfare with a philosophy that demands respect for Mother Earth. It's, it's complex, and it's something that needs to be constantly negotiated, constantly questioned, constantly challenged, constantly improved, debated. And I think without that, there can be no progress. And, uh, you know, how anyone defines progress is also a a contentious issue. Catherine, when you mentioned uh, the future of Bolivia, what's going on on the ground now? What is, you have a new president, you have Moss in power. Is it different? Is it the same? Talk to us about that. Well, it's decidedly different. And I, I think there are a series of things One, that we're in the aftermath of the coup. There's a need for justice after the coup, but a justice system that isn't equipped or designed to handle that. Um, And so you have impunity. You have security forces that were implicated in the coup whose commanders are in house arrests or on trial but there hasn't been clarity about the loyalty of the security forces, of other members of the security forces, if something like this is to happen again. So that's another tenuous issue. The possible, you know, only very few, I think four leaders of the parastate groups have been sentenced. But there are members of these groups that could reactivate any time. Another uh, fear or concern. And at the same time, you have a new MAS administration that has moved, you know, where you have a, a president who's a former Morales minister, but a cabinet that is less representative of indigenous nations and workers groups and more upper middle class and chosen more because they are people the president confided in and not as much as what had been in the past where there were some key people who were Morales' confidence, but also key representatives from indigenous nations and from social movements so that they could be included in the government. And I think 
since the coup, this accessibility of social movement and indigenous nations, their ability to uh, express views, to enact change within the state, has still not been reactivated and is, has, is severely curtailed. And so those are all issues that really need to be addressed, and they're issues that have caused a huge cleavage in mass between people who are in the new government and people that support Abel Morales or, or his line and his philosophy. And I think that it's a really worrisome internal conflict, although the issues being debated are crucial issues and central issues. The challenge is how do you become inclusive? How do you hear everyone's voice? How do you create a situation where we don't have another coup? And all of those issues have not been fully addressed yet. And you're listening to American Indian Airwaves. We're speaking with Catherine Letterber of the Andean Information Network with an update on the 2019 coup forcing former indigenous president of Bolivia, Eva Morales, into exile, the U.S. government's complicity, and more. And now back to the interview here on American Indian Airwaves. And Catherine, um, I guess one example, if you could provide, is talking a little bit about uh, former uh, Bolivian opposition leader Luis Fernando Camacho, um, who was arrested in December of last year, and and his role in the destabilization in certain areas of Bolivia, like Santa Cruz. Sure. You know, I, I was amazing to hear uh, the concerns from U.S. congressmen, including my congressman, saying, oh, this is becoming an autocratic state. Poor Luis Fernando Camacho. Let's remember who Luis Fernando Camacho is. He, he's from the Santa Cruz oligarchy, a very racist group that discriminates against indigenous populations, people from the highlands who are largely indigenous, who came up first as the vice president of the Santa Cruz Youth League, a paramilitary organization that openly employs the Nazi salute, and then became head of the Santa Cruz Civic Committee. During the coup, they blockaded for three weeks. They beat indigenous people that tried to go through the blockade. And then he admitted openly on television that he and his father had paid off the security forces to rebel against the democratically elected government. And so I should be no surprise to anyone that he's in jail now. After admitting that on TV, it took them a long time to put him in jail, and they have the you know the direct bank deposits into the account of the uh, commanders of the armed forces to show this. So he played kind of a key mobilizing role, a key crucial role. He went down to La Paz. I think that he was perceived by many in the United States as maybe a future president. They would have this interim government. They would put in Añez, and they would have elections eventually, although during the coup, they burned most of the electoral court, so you couldn't have elections quickly, and that he would be, that he would be a, a good president. You know, he, very racist, very discriminatory, uh, very abusive. I'm very pleased he's in prison. It's a, a positive perhaps second or third step to what we need to do to recover from the coup. Catherine, uh, we've been talking about what's transpired in Bolivia, but also the role of the U.S. government in destabilizing Bolivia, but also understanding, while not explicitly stated, that in destabilizing the Morales administration is part of uh, U.S. policy is that American taxpayer money that's being used um, or that was used to do that. And we've talked about the extractive mining industry, particularly uh, uh, LNG and, and lithium. But I was just curious in, in everything that's transpired, and you mentioned this at the beginning of the interview, is the COVID-19 pandemic. And I was wondering if talk about how that has impacted indigenous peoples down uh, in the plurinational state of Bolivia. 
Well, I, you know, I, I thought it was very poignant. I would walked up to the community behind my house in the mountains, and there was a very elderly man that was walking down. And he said, would you like to know what the difference is between Abel Morales in power and this government in power? He said, I'm starving. There's nothing to eat. And so I, I think when... You have a, you know, when you have something as tremendous as a pandemic with a right wing government that believed, I mean, one of the things that, that Anya is used to say frequently is she would never give the order to kill another human being. But it's because she didn't believe that indigenous people had the same status. So you had rural communities cut off, no health assistance no assistance of any kind until they eventually gave some bonuses, no movement towards getting a vaccine, and very harsh uh, curfews. We were only allowed to go out one morning a week on foot Mm. to search for food. But most of the Bolivian population that works on a day-to-day income had no income because they weren't able to work, and as a result, there was very, very little to eat for over a year in Bolivia. And that, obviously, rural communities were hardest hit. And so, you know, worldwide catastrophe is worse with a repressive government, undoubtedly worse. And how does the the drought and what most people understand as the climate crisis structure um, and contribute to what we've been talking about? Well, I I think that we're seeing in Bolivia, you know, what we're seeing many other places, but to a certain extent, because of the diverse microclimates, so you can drive from Bolivia from one of the highest altitude points to almost sea level in the Amazon jungle in a four to five hour period, is that we're seeing, and to give you an example of how dramatic climate change is, I've lived in Bolivia for over 30 years. And the rainy season, when I moved there, began in September, and it rained lightly every day, almost every day through March. Now the rainy rainy season begins in January, and there are torrential rainstorms for a month and a half and flooding. Most of the glaciers have melted. Uh, We have droughts and floods. We have frequent forest fires. You know, these are also phenomena that are happening in the United States. But, But we have, because we're at a high altitude and under the hole in the ozone layer, very, very strong sun and a lot of issues with uh, eye problems and skin cancer. But a noticeable, dramatic difference in the climate. And I think perhaps many people who live in cities or places where you have central heating and you have air conditioning, you may not notice those dramatic changes as much. But if if you're outside and you're in Bolivia, it's shocking. Catherine, what are the last thoughts you want to leave with our listeners? Uh, I think the last thoughts are that, you know, democracy and inclusion are imperfect and they're fragile and they need to be protected and fought for and we need to be vigilant. We need to be vigilant uh, of, you know, very corrosive, racist, undemocratic threats because I think we, we see them every day. We see them in the United States. We see them in Latin America. And, and I think that, uh, you know, waiting to see what happens is, is, is never the solution. It's time for everyone to speak out, to say what they hear, to begin to document suspicious things because from one day to the next, everything can change. And that was really scary. Well, Catherine, what what lessons can we learn then from this coolie talking about this new formation and using the, the internet and these 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 forces out there, these influential economic and right wing forces, as well as misinformation out there? 
what, what can the American public learn from this all? Do you think that it's just a, a matter of, of shoring up our information, or is it more so is about really being understanding and look at what's going on in Abayala South? Well, I, th- I think we have, we have to be in contact and we have to look at what's going on everywhere and highlight some of those really corrosive patterns that are going on in both places. And this coup strategy, they tried it in the United States. They're doing something similar with a long burn in Peru right now. We see with the Guatemalan leftist candidate elected, the right is still trying to block his election. And so we, we need to be vigilant and we need to look at patterns and the roles of parastate actors. And we need to be critical readers and we need to actively seek out information and verify what we see and what we read because we're being bombarded largely with garbage. And it's so easy to just get caught up in the sway and to let indifference overtake you. The moment of silence is over. And that was Catherine Letterbird, director of the Andean Information Network, speaking with Marcus Lopez, co-host and executive director of American Indian Airwaves, and myself. She was speaking on the 2019 illegal coup that forced democratically elected indigenous president Evo Morales out of office and the U.S. government's complicity, the lithium mining extractive industries and its impact on Bolivianos, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. For more work on the Andean Information Network, you can visit their website at ain-bolivia.org. And that concludes our show for today here on American Indian Airwaves. A special thank you to our guest, Catherine Lederber. A special thank you to our musical guest, Aragon Star, Koopa Aina, and the band Blackfire. American Indian Airwaves is mixed and mastered in the studios of Burnt Swamp Studios in Signal Hill, California. For Marcus Lopez, I've been your host for the hour, Larry Smith. Until next time. Silence is over.